Support for Pass Gas is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below the belt grooming. You know what I'm talking about, guys. Manscaped offers precision engineered tools for your family jewels. Let's talk about shaving down there. It can be sketchy. If you know, you know. That's all I'll say. It's it's scary having a, a little machine trimmer so close to your junk. And that's why I love Manscaped's new electric trimmer, the Lawnmower 3.0. The Manscaped engineering team spent 18 months perfecting the greatest ball hair trimmer ever conceived and just released the new and improved Lawnmower 3.0. Millions of balls are about to be nick free thanks to Manscaped's advanced skin safe technology. Look, it's just as awkward for me to say it as for it is for you to hear it. <laughs> One of the coolest features is the LED light, which illuminates the grooming area for a closer and more precise trim. I love this feature. It's probably, the, probably my favorite part of it. They've also upgraded the lawnmower to a 7,000 RPM motor with quiet stroke technology. If you are listening to me speak right now or watching me, I want you to experience it firsthand for yourself. Trim that junk of yours, get 20% off and free shipping with code GAS at manscaped.com. That's code G-A-S, GAS at manscaped.com. Your balls will thank you. When you picture Ayrton Senna, you see his dark, focused eyes and a mop of hair covering a surprisingly goofy pair of ears. Maybe you picture his iconic yellow helmet with a green and blue stripe, representing his home country of Brazil. But perhaps more vividly than anything else, you see Senna as he was on race day during the years when he became maybe the greatest racer of all time, wearing the iconic red jumpsuit of the McLaren Formula One racing team. McLaren is where Senna transformed from a promising F1 racer struggling with subpar cars to a legendary champion on a dominant team. It's where Senna's rivalry with Frenchman Alain Prost, the coldly calculating racer known as the Professor, would boil over in unpredictable and violent fashion. McLaren is where Senna would become the youngest ever three-time world champion in F1 racing history. Senna in McLaren red was like Babe Ruth in Yankee pinstripes or Kobe Bryant in Lakers gold. It was the suit of armor he wore for his greatest battles. On today's Pass Gas, it's McLaren red versus McLaren red. Fiery Brazilian passion versus chilled French steel. One of the most epic rivalries of all time, Senna versus Prost. Past Gas Podcast. <laughs> uh, welcome back to Past Gas, everyone. I'm your host, Nolan Sykes, along with my co-hosts, Joe Weber. Hey, fired up. Sorry, that was not a... I was not ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> and James Pumphrey. Oh, I mean, that's my new podcast catchphrase. <laughs> <laughs> just a, a bo- just a belabored sigh. There you go. No, no, it's oh. like a, um, it's like an Iggy Pop in the Stooges. Like, oh, I thought it was like a rap thing. Uh, no, uh, like, uh, uh, uh. like yeah, Sir Mix a Lot does I, that. Mm-hmm. I think I really like I really like the Stooges. I really like Iggy Pop and the Stooges. They're a really good band from back in the day, as opposed to say the Beatles, who are uh, not a good band. Oh, uh, I was wondering where that was going. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my internet lagged a little bit, so it really sound it. You sounded James like a tired Zach De La Rocha. You're just like, <laughs> oh, and that was it. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, yeah. So, like I said, today's episode. It's all about Senna's time at McLaren, uh, a very important time, obviously, in Senna's career. I don't know. I think the, the first two episodes of the series have been pretty exciting, and I'm excited to see uh, where we go today. 
Yeah, I think like, you know, a lot of people have seen the documentary and I think when you think of Senna, this is the time that you think of. This is like, like you said in the intro, this is when he became a legend. Like this is where like all the anime cartoons and stuff take place. This is like when like the laps uh, with that, like who did that? The light laps thing. Like that's when this that this is when that happened you know like that there's like that video of like the lights of that lap around suzuka circuit anyway this is when <laughs> senna became senna this is like it's this like is, an animation this, right so yeah like this is when like he got his rings this is like when jordan was uh just this is jordan in the in the 90s or whatever you know this is like when his career was at its peak for sure for sure and I think his rivalry with Prost is like the most interesting part of that that documentary for me. And I still like have such a visceral reaction when I see El- Elaine Prost in like the Renault pit on Drive to Survive. I just like, oh, like, wanna like, oh, yeah. <laughs> kick this little guy. He is definitely a divisive uh figure within the sport. Um you know, I think sometimes that cold and calculating kind of vibe is not as fun to root for opposed to a very passionate and more genuine seeming uh, aura like Senna had. There's like uh, lovable sociopaths and then there's like Elaine Prost. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's like, like when uh, uh, Nico Rosberg and Hamilton were uh, together on Mercedes uh hamilton i would argue is also very a, a pretty calculating driver there's not a ton of and he's, he, he can get emotional especially in his earlier years but rosberg was just not if you're a mercedes fan you're probably rooting for lewis and not rosberg because rosberg was really there to just like get the job done uh mm-hmm. even if he did come off come off as whiny sometimes uh and i think there there's a, a parallel there to uh Senna and Prost in this episode. So uh, let's uh, let's I'll, I'll just I'll just continue reading. How about that? Ayrton Senna versus Alan Prost is indisputably the greatest rivalry in the history of F1, and one of the greatest in all sports. It's also utterly unique. In what other sports rivalry can two teammates also be each other's greatest competitors? They were teammates and rivals simultaneously pushing each other to the absolute limits of their capabilities often leaving the rest of the F1 field far behind. But how did this rivalry begin? And at the end of the day, who was a better racer? And who played dirtier? Was it Senna, a ruthless menace on the track where his collisions with other racers, including Prost, would prove to be of massive consequence? Or was it Prost, whose behind-the-scenes political scheming became as much a part of his strategy as his coldly calculated racing style? In 1988, Senna, after four seasons in Formula One, was ready for the next phase of his career. Uh, If you remember from last episode, he was at Lotus, driving the golden camel cigarettes car. Uh, And he had established himself as a formidable racer on the Tolman and Lotus teams. But he struggled with cars there that were not fast enough, which is a problem in auto racing. In 1987, for example, his Lotus 99T's Honda RA166E engine was a model behind the Williams team's Honda 167E engine. Uh, Senna was almost like the kid in school who didn't have a backpack and had to carry all of his books around in a shopping bag, but uh, still somehow (laughs) managed to do well. It's a strange analogy. Uh... (laughs) I mean, his parents bought him a backpack, but then he lost it. So, <laughs> yeah, and then they're like, "Hey, you gotta, you gotta use a, a Ralph's paper bag." I think it's more McLaren. like so he does have a backpack, but it's his older sister's hand-me-down backpack. So it's just like not as good. It was a really like good a backpack, backpack like a couple of years ago, and now yeah. it's like got holes in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was like it was a Jan Sport, like a brand new Jan Sport. Mm-hmm. Uh, but now the zippers are kind of getting jammed up with like threads mm-hmm. and someone drew a dick on it. Right. And she left a sandwich 
in there like over a whole summer break and like no oh, matter how wow. many times he washes it it still kind of <laughs> smells i've had that backpack before that has oh, that yeah. musty bread smell in it <laughs> oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and like the the peanut butter and jelly somehow fermented a little bit so it has like that nice little like sting to the scent yeah no we've been there man <laughs> yeah we were all i definitely poor. definitely left a few sandwiches in my backpack in my day uh, <laughs> uh, all right back to mclaren uh the man to make it happen was ron dennis the British-born owner and team principal of McLaren since 1981. Uh, you, If you want to hear more about how that all happened, check out part three of our McLaren series, uh, and you get all the all the dirty details of how, how he came into possession of the team. It's a cool story. Dennis's team had dominated throughout much of the 80s, but in 1987, the year before Senna joined, McLaren was on the struggle bus. Dennis's first task was to find a replacement for the underperforming tag Porsche engine. His first choice was Honda, who was supplying engines for the dominant Williams team, but was unhappy with Williams refusing to replace Nigel Mansell with Japanese racer Satoru Nakajima. Honda, not coincidentally, has a working relationship with Senna, uh, as he'd been driving with the 167E Honda engine for Lotus the year previous. Honda leadership loved Senna, comparing him to a samurai, which seems like one of the highest compliments you could get from a Japanese car company. Yeah, it would be like a, an American car company being like, that guy's a cowboy. That guy's a Paul <laughs> <Yeah>. Bunyan. <laughs> <laughs> that guy's a straight up lumberjack. Yeah. I think, yeah. I, I mean, cowboy, I think, is probably the... Like, dude, if you were racing with like a Ford or a Chevy engine and they called yeah. you a cowboy... Yeah. Yeah. I just got <laughs> goosebumps, dude. <laughs> the Honda Senna bond would go on to be one of the strongest driver manufacturer relationships in the sport. And he became an idol in Japan, making multiple appearances on Japanese game shows, getting mobbed by adoring fans on the street and even receiving an authentic samurai helmet as a gift from an admiring Japanese businessman. I have to wonder how authentic, cool. A Japanese, like a, a samurai helmet would be like, was it an antique, like a legit antique, or was it just like a, a reproduction made in the same way? Uh, I don't have the answer, so I can't tell you, dear listener, but, uh, no, but we're going to do that. an entire episode on that helmet. Uh, <laughs> that's what part four of this series is. <laughs> but where did he get that helmet? And who was the Japanese <laughs> businessman? This episode is brought to you by Ghost of Tsushima. A new game from <laughs> Sucker Punch. <laughs> anyway, sorry. <laughs> Looks pretty. That was good. a good pull, dude. I didn't even know what that <laughs> game is. It says it's a samurai game. It looks really dope. With that relationship in mind, Dennis seized the opportunity and performed an incredible feat of deal making, bringing Honda and Senna on board to McLaren for a simultaneous three-year commitment. Uh, Senna joined the seasoned Alan Prost already racing for McLaren, and already a two-time F1 champion. So, they're, like, Honda probably didn't want to come onto McLaren unless they could get Senna with them. It was a package deal. Uh, Senna probably felt the same way. And for Dennis, that really worked out in his favor. I bet That's, Prost was so pissed. Yeah. Like, you've, you've won two F1 championships, and now this other, like, really really good driver is going to be on the team like we talked about this before like number one and number two like there is you know different people like the car set up different ways and like you just somebody inherently gets more love on the team and oh yeah when it's really clear that you know what the hierarchy is you know it's obvious that you're going to get the love but i think all of a sudden the hierarchy is not clear anymore and senna is already like the kind of guy who's like yeah i am number one you know to the point where they on lotus they hired <laughs> yeah. uh, uh Jim, billy dumpfries or what <laughs> pj butters or <laughs> whatever um i i think it was probably bittersweet for alan because you know as a champion you want to have the best engine you can Mm -hmm. um it just it kind of sucked that 
for that to happen for him, you you're now your teammate is now this phenom who definitely thinks he's number one. I think you're correct in that regard, James. You really can talk a lot of smack because he's bringing so much with him, and yeah, I don't know. I feel like he would be such a little whiny guy back then. God, I don't <laughs> like this guy. <laughs> no, he's not very likable. Really, I really like his hair. Um, oh it's yeah, not, it's it's very it's like it's a it goes down to maybe like chin length and it's very curly. I think I would like to emulate his hairstyle, bring that back. <laughs> I think he should. I think he definitely should. It is definitely getting to like a weird length right now. I'm in, I'm in that weird stage officially where it's just too much. You have beautiful curls. I think you should keep. They're really popping today. Yeah. My hair is ri- looks ridiculous now. I wear a hat every time I'm on camera. <laughs> yeah. I also bruise really easily now because I'm on blood thinners. Oh. I'm just bruised up. I feel not good about you have like <laughs> you have like life for the world birdies paw prints and bruises all over your body <laughs> yeah. dude birdie is a brute these days we don't have to get into it but she is a bully <laughs> she is the boss of the house i have a 16 pound mini golden doodle that is just ruining my life <laughs> that's the most la sentence i've ever heard in my life it's ruining my life <laughs> My 16 pound golden doodle is ruining my life. (laughs) (laughs) The car that both Senna and Prost would drive in the 1988 season was the McLaren MP44, widely considered to be one of the greatest Formula One cars of all time. It's definitely one of those, like, it's the silhouette of this car is. I think what many people would think of when you like if someone mentions F1 car, that's like mm-hmm. the shape that you imagine. Yeah, and I'd say the livery too. Absolutely. Uh mm-hmm. the the white and red Marlboro uh Chevron is so so awesome. For the design, Ron Dennis again secured the services of American engineer Steve Nichols, who had also designed the previous MP43. The MP44 Featured Honda's RA168E, 650 brake horsepower, 1.5 liter V6 turbo engine. 1988 was set to be the last year Formula One would allow turbo engines uh, until the uh, hybrid era that we are now in. And many teams were trying to get ahead of the curve with naturally aspirated models. Uh, Nichols, however, stuck with the turbo, incorporating it into an already incredibly aerodynamic design, with both engine and driver placed very low to the ground. The design philosophy of the MP44 would be based upon refinement of McLaren's previous concepts rather than reinvention, and the gamble paid off. The MP44 is widely considered to be, if not the greatest F1 car of all time, no doubt thanks to Prost's and Senna's performances behind the wheel of the car. The pairing of those drivers with this car, I think, is really what makes it so iconic. Um, mm-hmm. You have other drivers in there that maybe don't do as well. It's just not as cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, there's this car called the the Jordan 191. I think you guys should check it out just so you know what I'm talking about here. Um but it's it's one of the best looking easily best looking F1 cars out there for sure. Mm-hmm. It's just it looks like a freaking like bull shark. It's so cool looking. But uh it didn't really do that well. Um mm-hmm. just looking at its record. So like I think if like you had like a lesser driver in the MP44, it might not have that same kind of iconic aura. Like it's a great looking car no doubt, but like the accomplishments made in it are what make it so iconic. I think. 100%. 100%. Under Ron Dennis's leadership, all the pieces were in place for McLaren to be a dominant contender in the 1988 F1 Championship Series. The first race of the season was held on April 3rd in a location that would be tailor-made for Senna to kick off an incredible season, Rio de Janeiro in his home country of Brazil. Home track advantage, however, was apparently not a thing for Senna. In four previous Brazilian Grand Prix, Senna had never actually won. Ironically, his teammate Prost had dominated in Brazil, having won four of the last six Brazilian F1 races. 
More like Rio de Aleno, am I right? <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome that's an awesome joke i think there's some baseball teams that um like the cubs come to mind i always whenever i watch cubs games at home or when they're at home uh they lose and i don't know if it's just because i'm watching or if i just count the losses and i don't count the wins it's definitely because you singularly are watching the game you have affected the outcome yeah it's um, like the double slit theory bad. dog yeah dude that's what i'm saying the pressure on Senna at this point in his career, both external and internal, was immense. Senna had reached the pinnacle of his racing potential, earning a spot through sheer grit and determination on the best team in Formula One. But people close to him would later say that they had never seen Senna so tense. I get it, man. You know, I, I like to think that making car, car videos for YouTube, the pressure that I feel on a weekly basis is incredibly similar to uh piloting a, a formula one car it's the same and, exact uh, thing it's the same exact thing exact thing it's what everyone um, says like it's like lewis hamilton says that i think yeah you know daniel ricardo has been in the office a couple of times he said that he's like yo like i get what you go through and like i 100 percent know that you 100% get what I go through. You know what I mean? Like yeah, some podcasters training. lose like 15 pounds per <laughs> recording session. <laughs> I, I met, I got to meet Daniel Ricardo twice. Uh, the first time though, he was in town. It was, it was national donut day, which is today, the day that we're recording. Oh uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So this was, I think three years ago. Now I was not an intern. I was just starting out, but uh, someone had to, had to deliver donuts to Daniel. Um, so I, I volunteered for the job. Uh, as I'm driving there, I realized that I really have to take a shit. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I'm just like, oh man, okay, so it's coming. I probably have time. This will be fine. I get in line though. DK's Donuts is incredibly popular and I had to stand in line for like 20 minutes or so. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just like, oh man, this is, I'm, I think I'm getting a little uncomfortable now, but I can make it. I'll, I'll make it. I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> I get the donuts. I get back into my car. And as I'm driving to the hotel that he's staying at, it really starts to hit me. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm like mildly clenching at this point. <laughs> I get to the street where the hotel's at. Uh, there's no parking. There's no street parking on the street. Cause it's like one of those like fancier neighborhoods where they don't want random people parking in front of their houses or businesses. So I just search for a parking garage, like two blocks away from Daniel's apartment, clenching at this point, fully on. Um, like at the end of 007 intro sequence. <laughs> <that's you. laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm like starting to sweat at this point. And also there's like a time constraint. I don't really know when Daniel is going to leave his hotel. Cause he's kind of on his way out. Um, yeah. luckily our, my coworker and our buddy, Tony, had gone ahead of me to kind of hold Daniel in position at the hotel. Uh, so I was like trying to coordinate with Tony, like, uh, D is Daniel good? I have to, I have to, mm -hmm. I have the donuts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like Olympic speed walking to the hotel, clenching. Uh, I walk in the door and as I'm walking in, I see uh, Tony in the lobby and Daniel and his posse coming out and we all like all meet in there. It was great. I was like, felt so relieved. Um, got him the donuts. He called me a good, a good, good dude. Uh, it was great. Anything I could have imagined. Um, but I still really had to go, uh, mm -hmm. and ended up having to, I, for some reason did not use the restroom in the lobby. I think I was intimidated by how fancy the hotel was and didn't want to like, yeah. I, I love ruin that. I love pooping in fancy places. That's like oh, my th one of my things. For sure. And I would do that. If I had to do it again, I would do that now. Cause like, I, I also love that feeling. But anyway, I, I exit the hotel and I make my way to a Starbucks a few blocks away and then had to wait in line. <laughs> anyway, it, it, it was fine. Uh, I got it handled, but it, it's just, uh, I just love that. Like, <laughs> it's like, okay, Daniel's about to go to the airport. He's about to get on a plane and stuff. Let's give him a big box of donuts to have to deal with. <laughs> like yeah, those one, 
hundred percent went went in the trash. Definitely, it was worth now, it. Now his his entourage ate those up. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. It's like, hey, you about to get on a plane? Here's a a hamster. All right, cool, man. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh man, so they wouldn't let me use the bathroom unless I bought something. So I I bought oh, an iced God. tea, and I'm like standing in line, so uncomfortable. I've never felt more relieved until after that. Yeah. But uh, my God, how was the poop? I I blew it up. <laughs> I blew it up. Uh, yeah, good times. What were we talking about again? Oh yeah, Senna. <laughs> the yeah. pressure, pressure, like the poop pressure on your anus. <laughs> <laughs> Support for Past Gas is brought to you by Manscaped, the best in men's below-the-belt trimming. Manscaped offers precision-engineered tools for your family jewels. And I say that because I took a rap class. Look, we've all been there, trimmed with like a rusty scissors or whatnot. It's sketchy. It's super sketchy. If you slip, you might never have kids. That's why Manscaped has redesigned the electric trimmer to make it easier than ever before. Their third generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to prevent manscaping accidents. Millions of balls are about to be nick free thanks to Manscaped's advanced skincare technology. It's never going to be sketchy again. You don't have to use scissors ever again. You have the lawnmower 3.0. They've also upgraded to a 7,000 RPM motor with quiet stroke technology, uh, pun maybe intended. And let's not forget about the charging stand. Show off your mower loud and proud because this intelligently designed stand is a convenient charging dock powered by USB. But that's not the best part. You can get 20% off your order plus free shipping if you put the code GAS at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com using the code GAS. Support the companies that support Donut so we can keep doing cool stuff for you guys. Uh, this is a great product. Go get it. In the qualifying laps in Rio, Senna channeled that anxiety <laughs> into focus, much like I did, posting the fastest time and edging out Prost. Nigel Mansell of Williams and Gerhard Berger of Ferrari. It was Senna's first time taking pole position in a Brazilian Grand Prix. Perhaps the home country curse was starting to show cracks. But then, in a warm-up lap, Senna's gear selector broke and he was forced to switch to his spare car. Senna, instead of starting in pole position, had to start in the back of the pack. This setback appeared to motivate him. After just one lap, he passed five drivers to take the 21st position. And 10 laps into the race, Senna was eighth. After 20 laps, Senna passed fellow Brazilian Nelson Piquet, driving for Lotus, to take second place. Now, he was only behind Prost. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. I think that also shows just how dominant that car was at the time, too. Because, like, I mean, you see the same thing in Formula One nowadays. If, for some reason... Lewis or uh, Valtteri gets put at the back of the pack. They can make pretty short work at the rest of the field. Then on lap 30, an official raised a black flag indicating that Senna's car was disqualified. Apparently, the FIA had reviewed the car trade at the beginning of the race and decided that it had violated procedure. Although Ron Dennis argued the officials wouldn't budge and Senna received no points for the race. With Senna out, Prost coasted to an easy win, securing his fifth Brazilian Grand Prix in seven years. Dude, that is like the lamest thing ever. Like this dude just gives like an amazing performance in front of a hometown crowd. Like it's just so tone deaf. It's like as the FIA, your job is to like build the sport and like make it a popular thing that like people care about. But instead, you're going to be like, um, actually, man, like, what do you think? Like, that's just bad PR. Like, you're yeah. just being like, that's dumb. That's hurting your business. Like, you are so stuck in like your little freaking like white nerd ass ways and like all <laughs> your stupid little rules that you're literally holding your sport back and keeping your sport from being exciting for a huge group of people. Yeah, absolutely. And that's. I mean, even today you see sometimes pretty, not pretty inconsistent, but sometimes you get inconsistent rulings like that. Uh, I can't remember a specific example, but I remember one last year that was pretty egregious. 
And I'm sure that's a very fun uh, statement to hear. But, you know, they definitely do need to hold themselves accountable when it comes to consistent rule rule holding, you know. Mm -hmm. They definitely play favorites a lot. But, I mean, every sport does it. Like, like football, like... They don't even slap, dude. Yeah, NFL doesn't fucking slap. <laughs> <laughs> With as bad a start as Senna could have had at McLaren, the season continued at the San Marino Grand Prix. In this race, McLaren avoided technical difficulties, and before the main race even began, qualifying laps would set the narrative for the remainder of the season. Senna won the pole position with a lap time of 127.14. Prost was less than a second behind at 127.92. That's like still Math almost eight out. tenths. That's Math a pretty big out, difference. Though. It's less than a second. Math yeah. checks out. <laughs> then with the third best time, Nelson, B Nelson Piquet of Lotus posted a lap a full three seconds slower at 130.5. Piquet's car had the same Honda engine as the MP44. While Senna and Prost were incredible competitors, what accounted for most of that three-second difference was Steve Nichols' superior MP44 design. I also think, I mean, we talked about it last time that like uh, Senna just loved to push the gap as much as humanly possible, and yeah. I think that's what I mean. 100%. He he beat he beat Prost by eight tenths. That's a pretty big gap in the same car. Yeah, this mm -hmm. dude gaps. <laughs> in the race itself, Senna notched his first victory for the new team, with Prost finishing second. Their cars fully lapped everyone else on the track, including the third-place finisher, PK. Although 30 cars were supposedly competing, after two races into the season, it was clear that 1988 was shaping up to be a duel between two drivers, Senna and Prost. With Senna and Prost having won a race apiece, the championship moved to Monaco Grand Prix, raced on the winding streets of Monte Carlo. Senna drove out of his mind fast, and I mean that literally. After a practice run, he described the experience in strangely spiritual terms. I suddenly realized that I was no longer driving conscious. I was in a different dimension. The circuit for me was a tunnel, which I was just going, going, going. And I realized I was well beyond my conscious understanding. That's so cool. I know. As he neared the end of the race with only a few laps remaining, Senna was an unbelievable 55 seconds <laughs> oh ahead God. of Prost Jeez. in second. Although second doesn't even seem like the right word for it, considering how far behind Prost really was. Senna, just like he described, was in a different dimension. Prost, to his credit, continued to push his car and at one point took fastest lap. Wow. That's crazy. Although it obviously wasn't enough to make a dent in Senna's lead. A prideful Senna couldn't allow Prost to have the honor of fastest lap. He pushed his car even harder and retook fastest lap with 11 laps remaining. Ron Dennis, probably crapping his little khakis at this point, got on the team radio and begged Senna to slow down to ensure the McLaren team a first and second place finish. The warning didn't work. Out of nowhere, Senna lost concentration and spun out, sending his MP44 careening into a barrier and ending Senna's day on the track. Senna furiously jumped out of the car, ignoring the marshals who were swarming around him. He stormed off the track and didn't stop, walked back to his Monaco apartment, still dressed in his race gear. That walk And then home, he cooked dinner, and then he ate dinner, <laughs> and he turned on the TV in his race gear. And he watched a Law & Order SVU. And then he's <laughs> like, hey, I, I'm a little hungry again. So he went back and took his leftovers out of the fridge and had a couple bites. And by that time, young Sheldon was on. And he never <laughs> missed young Sheldon. <laughs> that walk home may have been the lowest point in Senna's career. After three contests, Senna had failed to finish twice, despite driving the best car with the best engine on what should have been the best team. I got to say, though, it's kind of funny to imagine you're just getting coffee or something on the streets of Monaco, and then you saw this guy who I'm assuming was kind of little walk by <laughs> in his race gear uh, on his way home. <laughs> After that race, Prost, who had held on to win in Senna's absence, didn't hesitate to criticize his teammate, his teammate's mental lapse. He uh, never wanted to beat me. He <laughs> wanted to humiliate me. He wanted to uh, show the people that he was much stronger than me, much uh, better than me, 
that was uh, his weakness. Uh, can I have a cigarette? <laughs> Nobody can know what was going through Senna's mind after Monaco, but proving his mental strength, he pulled himself together for their next race. In the high altitude of Mexico City, the turbo engines of the McLaren team dominated as the naturally aspirated or ATMO vehicles of many of their competitors lost power from the thin air. Prost won with Senna in second. Ah, the come next on, man. Yeah, the next race was the Canadian Grand Prix, raced at the Man Man. At the man, man. <laughs> Great band. The next race was the Canadian Grand Prix, raced at the man-made Notre Dame Island in Montreal. The race was literally at sea level, but the Atmo cars didn't do any better than they did in Mexico. Senna and Prost had their first on-track duel for the lead, with Senna emerging victorious. At the sixth race of the season in Detroit, Senna won again. At Silverstone in Britain, where Senna had made his name in Formula Ford and F3 racing, the conditions were rainy, and Senna, famously a Poseidon-like god on wet tracks, took first, with Prost failing to finish. Halfway through the season, the McLaren team had won all eight races. Good Prost lord. And, Prost and Senna had split down the middle with four wins apiece. That's crazy. What? Senna's inconsistencies had cost him in the points race, however, and in points, Prost was ahead 54 to Senna's 48. Neither driver had yet found a way to pull ahead of the other. The season continued in Germany, Senna again dominating in the rain. In Hungary and Belgium, Senna won again, taking the lead in points and claiming four races in a row. With five Grand Prix remaining, the Constructors' Championship, awarded to the team with the most winning car build, was already clinched for McLaren. The following race would mark the only blemish on the season for McLaren. It was the Italian Grand Prix, being raced only weeks after the death of Enzo Ferrari. Both Prost and Senna failed to finish, and Ger Gerard Berger secured a poetic victory for the prancing horse. Can't be mad about that. No, nah, man, yeah. let him have it, you know? Yeah. We, we talk a lot of crap about Ferrari, but that dude did some pretty cool stuff, and he's definitely a guy who deserves to be honored, and I think that's exactly how he would want to be honored. Hell yeah. It would all come down to the Japanese Grand Prix, the second to last F1 race of the year. Senna had seven wins to Prost six. If Senna could win one more, he would clinch the championship. Senna had a slow start, stalling at the starting line, but as weather conditions worsened, he climbed his way to victory, passing Prost on the 27th lap. Much like in Monaco at the start of the season, he continued to push the envelope even after taking the lead, widening the gap to 13 seconds ahead of Prost. But unlike Monaco, Senna's mental focus didn't lapse, and he won the race in the Formula One championship. The Samurai yeah. had defeated the Professor. Hell yeah, those are always uh, classic rivals, Samurai and Professors. <laughs> well, the Samurai just like doesn't want to be told what to do, you know what I mean? It's just like... Yeah, Professor's always trying to tell you what to do. <laughs> yeah, man. Don't tell me what to read, Professor. <laughs> I'll read my own books. I've got a Garfield book inside this science <laughs> textbook. A Garfield book? Yeah. God, you gotta be a I huge have. Garfield. Yeah, not even not even a comic. <laughs> like a Garfield <laughs> novel. Yeah. Not a dramatic John, novelization. Yeah. yeah. It was Tuesday. John hadn't <laughs> showered in three days. <laughs> I always had a Garfield or Far Side comic book in my desk as a kid. Yeah, and that's yeah. why I'm like this today. I really liked Foxtrot. I really liked oh, uh, Foxtrot is good. Yeah, yeah. You got to be careful with those comics because like a lot of the guys who drew them came out to be like real weird. You're like, yeah, the, what is with that? I don't know. Like all the co comics of like my childhood. Like when I think back on them, I'm like, hmm, I should figure out if that guy's like a Nazi or something. Yeah, except for <laughs> Bill Watterson. Well, Bill he, Watterson was like super cool, never wanted cool. to license any of his stuff, like all that Kelvin pissing on Ford symbols. Those stickers yeah, are those all are, like bootleg. <laughs> those are all illegal. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Huh. I could talk forever about comic books, so let's not do that. Uh, I like that you <laughs> talked for 20 minutes about having to take a poop, but like <laughs> yeah. you, you draw the line on talking That's about That's where I draw the line, book. dude. Hey, it was pertinent to the conversation. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Okay, McLaren's collective accomplishment was astounding. Ron Dennis's team, 
driving the Steve Nichols designed Honda powered MP44 had won 15 out of the 16 of the season's races. Wow. Prost had shown relentless consistency throughout the season, placing in the top two in 14 races. And Senna showed why he was considered to be the most aggressive driver in Formula One, winning 13 of 16 pole positions. Alan Prost had notched seven wins, utterly dominant for any typical F1 season. But this was no typical season. His Brazilian teammate had won eight. Senna alone was the 1988 world champion. Hell yeah. He did it. Yeah. All led to this, man. Well, he All right, so uh, yeah, after that, uh, he he quit, and uh, <laughs> and everything is fine. So he's see you a, next he's time. an old man living out his beautiful life in Brazil <laughs> right now. Just kidding. The, the story continues in the off season. Prost, who was as much a politician as he was a professor, would demonstrate his willingness to maneuver behind the scenes. Unhappy with what he felt like was Honda's preferential treatment for Senna's driving style, Prost met with the head of Honda R&D, Nobuhiku Kawamoto. It was not a fruitful meeting. Honda's young engineers mm. loved Senna, their heroic samurai, and Kawamoto declined to make any promise to tailor the engine's design to Prost's wishes. Hell yeah, they shouldn't. Yeah, L O freaking L, dude. <laughs> he tried to be a little narc and they were like nah sorry <laughs> sorry man uh turns out uh we don't like you very much because you're a freaking square we like the other guy even though you're trying to be a little narc go home you little baby <laughs> good lord in 1989 turbo engines which were such a dominant element of mclaren's 1988 strategy were now banned the McLaren team's 1989 car was the MP4-5, again designed by Steve Nichols. It carried over many design elements of the MP4-4, but was now naturally aspirated. The 4-4's V6 was replaced with a 3.5 liter V10. These V10 and V12 engines F1 teams were using to compensate for a lack of turbo were a huge hit with race fans, as they were much more throaty and aggressive sounding. This is... Uh... Around the time when HKS developed a V12 for F1, but it never raced. Oh, wow. 88 had proved to be a great battle, but by 1989, Senna versus Prost would turn from a competitive rivalry to a feud filled with spite and resentment. It all started at the second race of the season. In the season opener, a home victory in Brazil had once again escaped Senna's grasp. He and Prost were both looking to the Imola track of San Marino for their first win. Senna had the fastest qualifying time with Prost two tenths of a second behind. Before the race, seemingly in an attempt to cool their rivalry and focus on team performance, Senna and Prost had agreed to a strategic pact. Whoever was in the lead after the first turn of the race would be allowed to keep the lead for the race. After the start, Senna took first, but on the fourth lap, Gerard Berger's Ferrari veered off the track and slammed into a wall at 180 miles per hour, bursting into flames. Luckily, Berger survived the crash with some injuries and burns, and half an hour later, the race was restarted. After this reset, Prost was the one to take the lead. That's so slimy. Apparently, Prost interpreted the reset as a new chance to decide the racing order between him and Senna. Senna called bullshit and passed Prost later in the lap. In that moment, any existing bond between the two McLaren racers was broken for good. And Senna held on to win by more than 40 seconds, humiliating Prost and redeeming himself from his disastrous crash at Monaco the previous year. No, but you didn't, you didn't honor the pact that we had. This aggression would not stand, man. Midway through the season, Prost announced that he was leaving McLaren for Ferrari. He complained that the McLaren team was increasingly built around Senna, which was a fair point because Senna was <laughs> dominating. <laughs> yeah. McLaren and Honda both loved Senna, and his personnel and resources often eclipsed those of Prost. As the season went on, Senna won six races to Prost's four, but the professor had done the math, and by consistently placing on the podium, 
Uh, he was ahead in points with two races remaining in the season. This is where the show gets interesting. Okay, guys. <laughs> for all the listeners, you guys were waiting for it to get interesting. Here's where it gets interesting. We should tell people to skip to the middle of the episode at the beginning of the episode. <laughs> yeah, let's make a note. <laughs> Just as in 1988, the Japanese Grand Prix would be a deciding race in the F1 championship. Senna had to win this race in order to keep his championship hopes alive. Although the Senna Prost feud had begun with the backstage packed drama, uh, this time the nastiness would spill over into broad daylight on the track. With seven laps remaining in the Japanese Grand Prix, Senna trailed behind Prost. And on the final turn before a straightaway, Senna made a move to pass on the inside. Prost uh, left no room for Senna and even and cut his wheel which caused him to slam into Senna's car. Almost immediately, they were passed by Alessandro Nanini racing for Benetton. Senna was furious, and Pr Prost figured the race and the season were over. They had both crashed, and he had effectively secured the championship for himself by uh, refusing to allow Senna to pass. Prost unbuckled his seatbelt and exited his car, retiring from the race. But Senna refused to surrender. He gestured to the race marshals to help push his car. Uh, they push started it, in fact, and he returned to the race, stopping in the pit to replace his damaged nose cone. Rejoining the race, Senna caught Nanini, winning the race and keeping himself in the chase for the championship. And this is when Prost ran up to the race officials and was like, wah, 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 wah. I remember this part. Little uh, yeah, so there's a really, this is like, <laughs> An iconic moment in this story i, I got to give a shout out to a, a channel called driver 61 it's done by uh, uh a race car driver named scott mansell no relation to nigel mansell um and he he has a about a 10 minute long video just breaking down this crash um and he kind of puts the blame on senna in fact um because prost was holding a consistent line through that turn the whole race Senna was about three car lengths back before this turn and really torpedoed in there to get that gap. And, uh, you know, Allen did turn into Senna. Um, but I, I watched some more footage of the crash. Uh, uh, there's an overhead angle of it, which shows Senna turn way before the, the entry of the turn into Senna's car. I think I'm going to put the blame for this crash on... Uh, Prost, in fact, because with the turn that he did turning into Senna's car, there's no way that he would have made the turn. It, it just, it's very, it's intentional, you know? I just think that he's, he's so cold and calculating. Like he knew that if he and Senna both crashed, he would win the championship. And I don't think his, his excuse was that he didn't see him. And I think that's BS. I think he knew this was like his plan he knew Senna was going to try to pass him at some point. He didn't plan on Senna rejoining the race. Yeah, he did. Exactly. He didn't. He, he figured both of them would be out, and that was that. Um, I, I think uh, Scott Mansell puts not all the blame, but some of the blame on Senna. I think that it can kind of be split between the two. I think Pross definitely made an intentional move to crash out Senna, but Senna was also approaching that gap from three car lengths back, and... Uh, it, it's it's just typical Senna, just going for that crazy uh, uh, miracle gap, you know. But yeah. that just shows that with the kind of the kind of guy that he was, you know. It's all it's it's just unstoppable force, immovable object, and I mean that's why Prost was going to leave the team anyway. It was just not a good relationship between the drivers, and this crash really illustrates that the best. Yeah, definitely check out Driver Sixty One, great channel. I think it deserves more subs. However, the fairy tale ending for Senna was not to be. Midnight struck, and Senna's MP45 was turned into a pumpkin. <laughs> In rejoining the race, Senna had missed a chicane, and the governing body of F1, known as the FIA, uh, actually disqualified him for missing this turn. Ron Dennis fruitlessly argued that no advantage was gained by missing the turn, but FIA president, a Frenchman by the mm, name of Jean-Marie Ballestre, would not <laughs> budge. In fact, the FIA would also fine Senna $100,000, give him a six-month suspension, and declare what? him 
a dangerous driver. Yeah, so like I said, you know, you watch the footage back, and while Senna is definitely playing chicken and being just really aggressive, Prost is clearly the one to cause the collision and appears to be reacting to Senna's approach by turning into his car. It's pretty, like, you guys got to watch that overhead footage. Um, it's pretty evident. Of course, this was like, what, 30 years ago now? It's almost not worth uh, trying to come to a, a trying to, to debate this, I think. This is just like one of those moments that happened in the story, and it's just a part of the, the history. It's just a thing that happened, and it's, just, it's something that really illustrates why I really love this sport, you know? It's just such good drama. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You couldn't write this, is what I'm <laughs> trying to say. Now, we get into conspiracy mode just a little bit. When Prost saw Senna rejoin the race, he headed straight for the race steward's office. The president of the FIA, Jean-Marie Balestre, was French and had a close relationship with Alain Prost. Once again, something smells. (laughs) Something don't pass the sniff test. Smells like Roquefort. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, so there might have been some favoritism there on the part of the FIA. Again, that's just another thing. Like, it's just it's part of the story, man. Yeah. In 1990, Prost was now at Ferrari. Senna remained at McLaren. The two drivers, no longer teammates, were free to openly attack each other in the press. Prost, in a spooky moment of foreshadowing, alleged that Ayrton thinks he can't kill himself because he believes in God, and I think that's very dangerous for the other drivers. Senna responded that... Because I believe in God and I have faith in God doesn't mean I'm immortal. I'm as scared as anyone of getting hurt. After two years of competition in which both men had won a championship, the 1990 year was again dominated by Prost and Senna. In the third year, patterns were beginning to show in both drivers' performances. Once again, Senna was bested by Prost in his home country, this time at the Interlagos track where Senna called home. Once again, Senna won in Monaco. After 14 races, Senna had won six and Prost had won five, far ahead of the rest of the field. Going into the Japanese Grand Prix, the situation was an eerie reversal of the previous year. Prost had to beat Senna to have a chance at the championship, but if both drivers failed to finish, Senna would be champion. Once again, politics reared its ugly head. Although Senna had qualified on pole at Japan, the pole position spot was not on the so-called racing line of the track, meaning that Senna would have to start in a section of the track that hadn't been grooved out with rubber from qualifying. Instead, Prost qualifying in second would get the superior side. Senna appealed to the stewards who concurred and agreed to change the position. However, Jean-Marie Balestra stepped in and overrode the decision. Prost would keep the favorable side of the track. Senna was furious. He had already stormed out of the driver's meeting after the director had reminded everyone that missing a chicane and rejoining the track would be disqualifying. Clearly a reference to the previous year's collision with Prost and honestly a pretty petty move. Senna resolved that. Senna resolved that despite his inferior starting placement, he would take the lead in the first turn at any cost. Nine seconds in the race, him and Prost repeated their game of chicken, with Senna trying to take the inside line on Prost. Again, Prost wouldn't yield, and the two collided violently. In less than the length of a single tick-tock, the race was over, and the championship was decided. Wow. After the race, Senna made clear... That it was an eye for an eye situation. Last year, I lost the title in a crash. This year, I've won it. And at the age of 30, Senna was now a two-time world champion. It was a victory, but an embittered and controversial one. After the race, Senna seemed troubled. Pro stated that he wanted to punch Senna in the face after being driven off the track, but he didn't because he's such a wimp and he's scared of (laughs) conflict. If your mailbox is anything like mine, 90% of the time, it's a pretty depressing place. You got your political ads, you got bills, you got more coupons than anyone could ever use. But once a month, I do have a reason to be stoked thanks to my box of awesome from Bespoke Post. I got this sweet canvas bag. It's the Weekender box from Bespoke Post. I use it all the time when I go to visit my parents. There's enough room in here for a weekend of clothes, and uh, this is probably one of my favorite things that I own. I'm not joking. (laughs) I love this thing. Bespoke Post sends guys only the best stuff every month. 
from style and grooming goods to barware to cooking tools to outdoor gear. To get started, take the quiz at boxofawesome.com. Your answers will help them pick the perfect box for you. It's free to sign up and you can skip a month or cancel anytime you want, no pressure. Each box costs only 45 bucks but has $70 worth of gear inside. That's called value. Get 20% off your first monthly box at boxofawesome.com with code GAS at checkout. That's boxofawesome.com, code GAS for 20% off. Thank you, Bespoke Post, for sponsoring this episode. In 1991, Senna had another goal in mind beyond beating Prost. For six seasons, victory in his home country had eluded him. In Brazil, which was going through a period of political turmoil, Senna was a bright spot in many people's lives, a saint-like figure who was revered both for his racing prowess and his generous charity. But to this point, on home soil, his saintly ability to perform F1 miracles always seemed to vanish. The 1991 Brazilian Grand Prix was held again at Interlagos. Senna won pole position and took an early lead in the race. With 10 laps left, he was well ahead of Ricardo Patrese, racing for Williams by a healthy 36-second margin. Then, disaster struck as Senna's gearbox broke. Patrese started to make up the difference between the two cars, catching up with each successive lap. Senna, now only able to drive in sixth gear, was struggling to control his car around corners and with three laps remaining, it started to rain. However, Senna held on to win by less than three seconds. Wow. This is like, this is like one of the most, this is like a defining moment of Senna right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, using only top gear to get around the track and still winning is such, can you imagine, dude? I, like, apart from the obvious, um, disadvantages of being stuck in sixth like why was it so physically draining on him that's what i didn't really get from the the documentary i imagine it's a lot of footwork going on yeah and i think probably the the adrenaline didn't help either like Mm -hmm. you know you're you're in a comfortable lead and then all of a sudden it's like ah crap (laughs) yeah but i imagine like the way he did it was like using the clutch a lot revving the engine up a lot dropping the clutch a lot like you know, to keep the, if you're in sixth or whatever, like to keep it in the power band. Yeah. I think like there's a lot of action going on like yeah. down below. Yeah. Cause he and literally since, like collapsed after the race. He was so exhausted. Yeah. I can't imagine his legs felt very good. And I mean, just having to like, you, you're really having to keep all that momentum through the turns. You're probably doing a lot, like a lot more, not a lot more steering per se, but I can't imagine it was easier to steer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think the adrenaline was just draining him as well. It's just yeah, such I'm crazy. Sure he he was just like thinking so hard too. Yeah. Like when I, my 16 pound golden, golden doodle. Okay. Uh, <laughs> right. If you, it's r- very hard to wear her out physically. Um, but if we mentally challenge her for <laughs> a little while, then she gets exhausted and we'll go to sleep. <laughs> sure. Senna had finally broken the curse and won in Brazil at the Interlagos course we had, where he had spent so much of his formative teenage years karting and dreaming of Formula One. He was overcome with emotion and physically exhausted, and, and as Joe mentioned, on the podium he could barely lift the trophy. After the sour vengeance of his 1990 championship win, this victory for Senna must have felt pure sweetness. Meanwhile... Prost was struggling with a Ferrari car that had fallen behind McLaren and Williams. He didn't hesitate to berate Ferrari management in public, and halfway through the season had failed to win a single race. At the 1991 German Grand Prix, Prost tried to pass Senna on the outside of a turn. Senna mercilessly held onto his line, which forced Prost, who had pulled up next to him, to miss said turn. After the race, Senna said... Quote, I think everyone knows Prost by now. He is always complaining by the, by, by the cars, the tires, or the team, or the mechanics, or the fuel, or the other drivers, or the other surface. It's always, it's always somebody else. 
Blame is never his fault. That is a <laughs> devastating burn, dude. <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah. Anyway, by the end of the season, Prost and Ferrari were done, and, Fer- and Ferrari gave Prost a severance bonus in exchange for a pledge not to race for another team in 1992. That's nutty. In a dream year that cemented his status as F1 legend, uh, Senna broke his home track curse in Brazil and handily won his third championship with seven wins and 12 podium finishes. Meanwhile, a winless Prost left Formula One altogether. Hell yeah. Off the track. Yeah. Get out of there. Get out of town. Off the track, <laughs> Senna was now mega famous. His controversial battles with Prost were international news and attracted a whole new generation of fans to F1. With his good looks and laid-back charm, you didn't have to be a racing fan to be a fan of Senna. In the materialistic era of the late 80s and early 90s, Senna had what appeared to be the ideal lifestyle. He owned a private jet and a helicopter, both of which he knew how to fly. He owned property all over Europe and South America. He water skied off the back of his luxury boats. He rode Ducati motorcycles. And generally, if there was an expensive hobby that existed, Senna was into it. At the same time, though, he didn't have the bad boy image of other F1 racers, many of whom lived like rock stars. Senna, while incredibly popular, was more of a soft daddy Paul McCartney type than a swaggering Mick Jagger. Soft daddy. (laughs) We talk about the Rolling Stones a lot on this show. Uh, More than anything, although Senna clearly enjoyed his glamorous lifestyle, it was clear that his mind was always, at least partially, at the track. With Prost vanquished, 1992 saw Senna's dominance in F1 finally diminish. Nigel Mansell would win the Drivers' Championship and help secure the Constructors' Championship for williams Renault. Perhaps without Prost, Senna had lost some of what had been driving him for the past four seasons. New racers were emerging, with a young Michael Schumacher winning his first race at the Belgian Grand Prix. Senna, who was always fastest driving from the back of the pack, now looked over his shoulder at the future of F1, and it kind of showed. He would show why he was loved in a different way, however, at the same Belgian Grand Prix where Schumacher began to make his name. The French driver Eric Comas crashed in horrifying fashion, passing out with his foot still on the accelerator. Senna, risking his own life on an active race course, rushed out of his car and killed Comas' engine. The act was a little bit of foreshadowing for Senna's increased focus on driver safety in the last years of his life. From this point on, much of Senna's story goes into the realm of what if. What if he had lived to compete with Schumacher, as Schumacher became even more of a dominant racer than Senna? What if Senna had moved into IndyCar racing, which he had flirted with in 1992, on the invitation of Penske driver and fellow Brazilian racing legend Emerson Fittipaldi? What movies would Heath Ledger have made? What songs would Kurt Cobain have written? We can ask these questions but we always have to return to the realm of what actually happened. So with that, next time on Pass Gas, it's the conclusion of our Ayrton Senna series. And it's going to be a sad one. I bet that I cry next week. I'm not looking yeah. forward to this one. Right. Um, but not to say that you guys shouldn't listen. Um, yeah. But it's going to be it's a good to cry. jerker. It's good to cry. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be a tough one for sure. Uh, but, hey, that was the rivalry between Ayrton Senna and Alan Prost. Um, <laughs> samurai and the Professor, man. Samurai and the Professor. Don't try to put a samurai in detention, teach. <laughs> yeah, you go, you, go <laughs> you get to detention, you French <laughs> teacher. I was, hoping that I, was, <laughs> I was hoping that I was being too hard on prost and i'd be like maybe there's something in this script will make me like change my mind on him but i honestly hate him even more than i did oh. <laughs> before i don't like that dude i hate is a strong word i was thinking about this in the shower and you know like just that the, the that kind of calculating conniving kind of vibe is just never as likable as a passionate mm-hmm. one even if you get this yeah. even if you get similar results yeah um like like I think Joe's very passionate where Nolan is just like very calculating and he's like oh, yeah. 
He's like, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to say most of the words because I don't think Joe should, or, you know, like, <laughs> that's, you're it's like, a good, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, I, I am the professor. Yeah. You're the professor. I'm the professor of donut. Joe's just, Joe's just like fired up. That's passionate. And Nolan's over here like, do, 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 you know, just like being a nerd straight up. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> He's um, like narking on everybody. I, I think I never I, knocked I think on that. nobody. I never <laughs> knocked on nobody. <laughs> <laughs> I think now more than ever, like narcs are really pissing me off. And like people that, you know, like yeah. protesters are running away. And I see videos of people like tripping them so that cops can catch up to them. Like f- that. Like, don't. Yeah, if you do that, you're, you suck. Or, well, yeah. now being a narc can get someone killed. I mean, not like that's new. We're just, you know, seeing it more because we have cell phones now. But like, don't narc on people, you narc ass. Like, yeah. Don't go out of your way to like narc on someone. It's yeah. dumb. Well, <laughs> to hear more about Senna and probably <laughs> some more narc stuff, just because, you know, it's the time <laughs> we're living in. Um, check out next week. We have part four, the conclusion of our series on Senna. Um, go ahead and give us a follow if you're watching this on YouTube. <laughs> wow, they're sent outside of Nolan's window right now. Go ahead and uh, <laughs> give us a hit that subscribe button if you're following us on YouTube. Uh, follow Joe across social media at Joe G Weber. Follow Nolan at Nolan J Sykes. Uh, follow Donut at Donut Media, and follow me at James Pumphrey. Um, you know, I love you guys, and uh, try and love each other um, right now. Yeah, be kind. Uh, Johnny Dumfries, if you're out there, we'd love to talk to you. Uh, (laughs) Be kind. Thanks for listening. All right.